हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन वाचिंग वेंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा India has beaten expectations with its growth numbers 8.4% in the last quarter in a gloomy international scenario this is nothing short of spectacular but some critics are still not convinced they've changed the goal post and they say this figure hides a slowdown we're not making this up we'll bring you the full story in the Israel Gaza war another horror story more than 100 people killed while trying to get food Gaza says Israel shot them Israel says it was a stampede and what does the rest of the world say we'll tell you In Iran it's voting day this election is not about the result it's about the turnout we'll explain In India three new projects on semiconductors with billions of dollars in investments and international partners it's a story worth tracking In Australia Facebook deletes its new tab news tab we'll tell you why What is Agalega and why is it important for India Mauritius strategic ties Why are China's new robot dogs making news Why Paul Pogba's story is a lesson for all of us What's happening in Haiti? What has triggered the new wave of violence? And our Friday special, what you're eating is killing you. The biggest ever study on ultra processed food will make you rethink your choices. The headlines first. Sri Lanka chooses India snubs China Colombo awards an energy deal to an Indian company scraps the tender won by a Chinese firm 2 years ago the project was temporarily shelved after New Delhi raised concerns over Beijing's involvement. Indian Prime Minister on a two-day visit to West Bengal Prime Minister Modi hits out at Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee says her party leaders are committing atrocities on women asking the public to give a befitting reply in the upcoming general election Russia's Foreign Minister Sergey Lavrov is in Turkey he will meet President Recep Tayyip Erdogan Lavrov's visit comes as Erdogan looks to revive the Russia-Ukraine peace talks and also ensure safe navigation in the Black Sea South Korean police raid the offices of the Korean Medical Association since last week nearly 10000 junior doctors have been on strike yesterday the deadline set by the government to end the strike expired but only 565 doctors have returned to duty A deadly fire rips through a shopping center in Bangladesh's capital Dhaka more than 45 people killed and many others injured the fire started at a restaurant in the 6 story shopping mall Authorities say a gas leak could have caused the blaze And Elon Musk sues OpenAI and its CEO Sam Altman. Musk says the ChatGPT maker has breached its contract by prioritizing profit. In 2015, Musk co-founded OpenAI but stepped down from its board in 2018. There are two kinds of football fans. One applauds every goal because they know how tough it is to score one. The other shifts the goal post. They find reasons to criticize. Maybe the opponents were not tough enough, maybe the defense was poor or maybe the player just got lucky. In this case, India has just scored a wonderful goal. I'm talking about the GDP numbers. Experts said India would grow by 6.6% in the last quarter. That's October, November and December. 6.6% was a projection, but the actual growth was 8.4%. It's a ridiculously high number. In footballing terms, like a bicycle kick from the penalty box, that good. And most fans are applauding it. Like the International Monetary Fund or the IMF, they say India is easily the fastest growing economy. yet doubters remain look at this bloomberg report it says india's blow out gdp figure masks signs of slower growth so what are they playing at a different indicator called gva that's gross value added gva now some experts are saying that gdp is great but what about gva so tonight let's answer that question what is gva why is it relevant and why has it suddenly popped up is this a case of shifting the goal post some technicalities first both gva and gdp are measures of economic output you can calculate gva from the gdp 
Just add all the subsidy payments by the government, subtract the tax revenue, and what you're left with is gross value added, GVA. India's GVA rose 6.5% in the last quarter. Before that, it grew by 7.7%. So India's GVA growth has slowed down. And the naysayers have latched on to this. Suddenly, GDP does not matter. Everyone's talking about the GVA. Convenient, isn't it? But let's indulge them for a moment. Why has the GVA pace reduced? It could be because of two major reasons. Either India's tax collection has increased a lot, or maybe the subsidy payments have fallen. Now, we don't know which one is true. But forget the technicalities for the moment. Focus on how important these numbers are. 8.4% GDP growth does not happen randomly. It shows that the economy is resilient. It shows confidence and trust in India's trajectory. And do not forget the context. When you read India's GDP numbers, you must factor two things. Number one, the global slowdown. Most major economies are struggling. The likes of Germany and Japan are in a technical recession. China's growth is just 5.2%. Imagine logging 8.4% in that context. It shows that India is a bright spot, like a winch pulling the global economy up. Factor number two, inflationary pressures. In 2022 and 2023, the Reserve Bank of India increased lending rates almost six times back to back. The idea was to curb the rising inflation, but in April last year, the RBI hit pause. It decided to hold the rate steady. It was a brave move at that juncture. Because even halfway into 2023, India's inflation was more than 7%, but the gamble paid off. The latest inflation number is 5.1%. If you exclude food and fuel, it's just 3.6%. Not perfect, but getting there. So India deserves a lot of credit for this GDP growth. It's not easy in these circumstances. I guess the question is, what next? We are into the last month of this financial year. The earlier projection for annual growth was 7.3%. It has now been increased to 7.6%. That should make India the fastest growing major economy in this financial year. Some, some tweaks are necessary, though. Manufacturing, for example, needs more attention. It grew by 11% compared to 14% in the quarter before. Private consumption is also a problem. It's very sluggish at 3.5%. Investment, though, is the driver. Investment increased more than 10% compared to last year. A lot of that is coming from the government. In fact, public capital expenditure remains the driver of India's growth, and it's paying off. We're talking about things like roads and bridges, schools and hospitals, things that can multiply your growth. It's a question of when these dividends will kick in. Until then, let's applaud this miracle goal in a season where even penalties are scarce. This one is a stunner. People attempting to essentially loot to, uh, to take that uh, aid um, from those aid trucks. Every war is dark, it makes your blood curdle, but some chapters make you question humanity itself, like this one in Gaza. It happened early on Thursday morning. Around 30 aid lorries were on the outskirts of Gaza City. What happened next is unclear. Israel says there was a stampede, that Gazans were trampling each other to death for food. But eyewitnesses tell a different story. They say Israel opened fire on them. Listen in. We went to get food and flour and they started shooting at us. Then we threw ourselves into the streets and no one looked for us. Eventually, people brought us here. As these vital humanitarian supplies were making their way towards Gazans in need, thousands of Gazans dispensed upon the trucks. 
Some began violently pushing and even trampling other Gazans to death, looting the humanitarian supplies. The unfortunate incident resulted in dozens of Gazans killed and injured. Look at the aftermath. Around 117 people were killed in this incident. More than 700 others were injured. And the pictures are horrible. Dead bodies were strewn across the area. Donkey carts were used to take away some of the remains. And the injured packed into hospitals. Gaza simply doesn't have the resources to handle such a tragedy. And just a reminder, these were not Hamas operatives or leaders. These were ordinary civilians. They had lost their homes, they had lost their livelihoods and family, and on Thursday they lost their lives. Their only mistake? Trying to get some food. Now Israel is vehemently denying any role in what happened. Their story is this. There was a rush for food, soldiers fired warning shots, a stampede broke out, more than 100 people died. And Israel has released some footage to back up this claim. It's a satellite video of the aid delivery. As you can see, it shows people surrounding the truck. So yes, there was a rush. I wonder why though. Maybe because half a million Gazans face starvation. Or because Israel has blockaded Gaza. Or maybe because Gazan children are surviving on cactus. I hope you get my point. We do need an independent investigation to ascertain what happened yesterday. But bullets or stampede, the blame lies with Israel because their war in, is, is limiting aid to Gaza. So if not directly, they are indirectly responsible. But guess who doesn't care? The United States of America. You've heard Joe Biden talk endlessly about human rights and freedoms, but not in Gaza. Even this time, there is no condemnation. Washington says they're urgently seeking information. You're urgently seeking additional information on exactly what took place. We have been in touch with the Israeli government since early this morning and understand that an investigation is underway. We will be monitoring that investigation closely and pressing for answers. What more does the U.S. need? 117 innocent people died while waiting for food. If this doesn't call for criticism, what does? After the incident, the UN Security Council tried to pass a resolution. It would have blamed Israel for the deaths. 14 out of the 15 members supported this resolution. Guess who held out? The United States of America. Joe Biden is largely isolated in his support. French President Macron accused Israel of targeting civilians. Canada called it a nightmare and European officials called it unacceptable. Yet what does Washington say? We'll wait for more information. The question is, how much longer will the support continue? You see, after October 7th, most of the world stood with Israel, including us. We defended Israel's right to hit back, to take out Hamas. But the campaign has clearly gone too far. The latest numbers are out. More than 30,000 Gazans have been killed by Israel. Around 21,000 of them were children, 21,000 children killed. So you have to question the strategy. Israel and Hamas were negotiating a ceasefire for Ramadan. But after Thursday, who knows? Joe Biden thinks it will complicate negotiations. I'll just we're checking that out right now. There's two, there's two competing versions of what happened. I don't have an answer yet. Are you worried that that will complicate negotiations? Oh, I know it. So what's the next step? The United Nations has called for an independent probe. Countries like Germany and Italy have backed it. Hopefully it will answer the important questions. But do not forget the larger picture. Stampede of bullets. This incident did not occur out of the blue. It's the culmination of 140 days of war. Unless that war ends, we cannot rule out a repeat. Now let's turn to Iran, where a different battle is underway, a battle for legitimacy and for control. Iran is holding its general election today. 61 million people are eligible to vote, but reports suggest the turnout won't be high. In fact, it might be the lowest in their history, at about 41%. The last election was held in the year 2020. A lot has changed since then. Iran is struggling economically. Inflation is at 40%. And that's the official figure, 40%. Analysts say it's closer to 50%. Add international sanctions to this and the falling value of rial, which is Iran's currency. Combined, this means the economic situation is dire. 
Same with the social situation. In 2022, the world heard about the death of Masha Amini, a young woman killed for not wearing her hijab properly. It led to some of the worst protests in Iran since the 1979 revolution. The authorities came down hard on the protesters. Some 500 people were killed in clashes. Thousands were arrested. Some were even executed. The regime brought Iran under control with repression. So you can imagine why the people are not keen to vote. Both our friends, those who love the Iranian people, and evil wishers are watching our country and our esteemed nation's issues closely. Pay attention to this. Make friends happy and disappoint the evil wishers. That was Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. The first person to cast a vote today, he asked his fellow Iranians to do the same as an act of defiance against Iran's ill-wishers. Well, who would that be? For Khamenei, that's the US and Israel. He believes they're hoping for a low turnout, so he's declared that voting is an obligation, an act of patriotism that every true Iranian must perform. We'll have to wait and see how many respond to his call. The votes are being cast today. Counting will be done manually over the next three days. Early projections should be in by tomorrow, final results by next week. Now, why is this election important? It won't affect the balance of power in Iran. It still rests with the Supreme Leader. There are about 15,200 candidates in the fray, fighting for 290 seats in Parliament. All these candidates are pre-approved, vetted by Iran's Guardian Council, which is a body appointed by the Supreme Leader. So the new Parliament will not pose any threat to Ayatollah Khamenei. They don't really have the power to do that. In Iran, the Supreme Leader dictates key issues of governance. He decides the foreign policy. He decides the nuclear trajectory. So what does the parliament do? It deals with budgetary issues and other matters of administration. They can't challenge the supreme leader. Also, Iran doesn't have a strong party system. They have some 103 odd parties. These parties are bunched into factions like hardline, conservative, reformist. Now, most of the candidates this time are from the hardline and conservative factions. They're completely loyal to the Ayatollah. I believe that Iran should improve its relations with all countries, resolve its problems with the international community, especially over the nuclear issue, and lift the sanctions. Because if we fail to attract investors, we will lag behind our neighbors. She's a reformist leader from the same faction as former President Hassan Rouhani, the one who signed the 2015 nuclear deal. The reformists once had a strong presence in Iranian politics, but this time they've been gutted. Out of 15,000 candidates, barely 30 are reformists. The others haven't been allowed to contest. So whoever wins, it will be a candidate chosen by the Supreme Leader. Which brings me back to the question, why does this election matter then? Because people aren't voting just for the parliament today, they're also choosing what's called the Assembly of Experts. It's a body of 88 clerics, the Assembly of Experts. And they choose Iran's supreme leader. The current one, Khamenei, is 84 years old. Time is not on his side. He may decide to step down. So this new Assembly of Experts is crucial. They will choose Khamenei's successor. And so he wants to choose them. Those who don't align with his views have been disqualified. Like former President Rouhani. He's a reformist. He's been a member of this assembly since 2007, but this time he's been disqualified. The message is quite clear then. Only the loyalists of Ayatollah Khamenei will choose his successor. So Iran's present system will continue with or without Khamenei in charge. Things will not change in the country and the people know this, which is why the voter turnout is low. They don't think Iran's politics will change. So sanctions will stay in place. They don't think the clerics can fix the rampant inflation. And those who want to reform, or those who want reform, don't even have candidates to vote for. They might as well stay home and watch heavily censored TV. But if the people do show up to vote, Iran can say that it is following the people's mandate. Which is why we say this election is not about the result, it's about the turnout. The clerics want legitimacy. Will the people of Iran give it to them?
Our next story is about semiconductors, better known as chips. It's the new oil. Chips run your life. They power all your gadgets. And as the world becomes more digital, chips have become central to our existence, which means they're also central to our economies. Chips have become a strategic resource, so countries want to secure supplies and boost production. Governments are investing billions and trying to win what's become the global chip race. Of course, India doesn't want to be left behind. Tonight, we'll tell you what New Delhi is doing to get more chips. It has made a big announcement. India has approved three projects. Total cost? Some $15 billion. The idea is to boost chip production. The first project is a semiconductor fabrication plant. It will be India's first. Set up by Tata Group and Taiwan's Power Chip, based in the western state of Gujarat in the Dholera region. Estimated cost? Some 91,000 crore rupees, that's $10 billion. Once ready, it's expected to produce 3 billion chips every year, 3 billion. Now, these won't be AI chips, they'll be more basic, but they should be able to power a lot of things like high power computers, electric vehicles, and electronics. The project should kick off in the next 100 days. That's number one. The second one is a chip assembly plant worth $3.2 billion, again to be set up by the Tata Group, but this one will be in the state of Assam. It will be India's third semiconductor unit. Once ready, it should be able to produce up to 48 million chips every day. This plant will mainly cater to export needs. And the third is a chip packaging facility. It will be set up by CG Power in partnership with Japan's Renaissance Elect Electronics and Thailand's Stars Microelectronics. The plant will be located in Gujarat, Sanand. It will make specialized chips to be used for sectors like defense and space. And the government is investing around $916 million for this. So three big projects, billion dollar investments and international partners. Connect the dots and you'll see the big picture. India wants to boost its semiconductor market. It wants to become a big global player like Taiwan and China. And these are not the first investments that India has made. Last year, New Delhi announced a $2.75 billion micron facility. This was during Prime Minister Modi's visit to the U.S. It is currently under construction. The plant is supposed to be ready by the end of this year. Meanwhile, Taiwan's Foxconn is planning a chip-making facility. Way. America's AMD, or Advanced Micro Devices, is also investing some $400 million in India. It is setting up its largest global design center here. So India has a lot of things going for it, but will that be enough? I ask because the semiconductor market is highly concentrated. It has few players and fewer stakeholders. More and more countries now want a slice of this pie. They want to boost their, dom their domestic industries and to protect themselves from impending chip wars. But it's a tough ask. Building a chip industry involves two things, billions of dollars in investments, and specialized labor. That's what you need, a lot of money and specialized labor. So while India is making investments and attracting new players and nurturing talent, it's a long road ahead. Setting up a robust chip industry is a long-term process. It could take decades. Take the semiconductor fabrication plant, for example, the, one, the first project that we talked about. Work will start in the next few months, but it will take at least, at least five years for the first chip to be produced here. Secondly, India is focusing on chips, but not AI chips, but that is the future. If you want to lead this game, you need to ace artificial intelligence. So while these projects are very important, India will have to sustain the momentum to become a credible player in this game. Now on to Facebook. The company has made a new announcement. It is shuttering its news tab in Australia and the US. For those who don't know, Facebook News was introduced in 2019. It shows the top stories of the day. It was earlier shut down in Europe. But now Facebook is getting rid of it in two more countries. The question is why? Because users are simply not interested. Facebook says it will focus on short-form videos instead. Our next report tells you why Facebook News did not work and how social media is changing news consumption. In 2019, Facebook News made its debut. It was introduced in America. The company signed multiple deals. They were with top publishers. 
the deals were worth millions of dollars. It soon expanded to countries far and wide. The idea was simple. Facebook wanted to be the place to go to for news. Its news tab highlighted the top stories of the day. But not anymore. Facebook is doing away with its news tabs in most countries. It's already not available in the UK, France and Germany. Now Facebook is doing away with its news tab in the United States and Australia as well. Why? Meta says news makes up for less than 3% of what people see on their Facebook feeds. So their argument is simple. Why pay for something that's not bringing users? Instead, the company is focusing on short-form videos, also known as Reels. That's the biggest moneymaker. So Facebook wants to focus on that. People can still view links to news articles and news publishers can still access accounts and pages. But the news tab will be gone. Which brings us to the question, what about the publishing deals? Facebook spent over $30 million securing deals with publishers in the US, the likes of the Wall Street Journal, CNN and the New York Times. In Australia, it pays around $45 million to outlets. Some of the names include Sky News Australia, News Corp, Seven, Nine and The Guardian. This was after Australia passed a landmark legislation in 2021. It requires tech platforms to pay for news content that's shared on their sites. That too will now stop. Pitting Facebook against the Australian government. Understandably, the move hasn't gone down well in Canberra. The announcement by Meta today is an abrogation of responsibility to Australia's news media sector. Australian journalists provide one of the most important public goods in our democracy. And Australian news media publishers deserve to be fairly compensated for the investments that they make in that. Australia is mulling its next steps. It's asking if Meta cares about journalism at all and whether the whole reason for taking this step is to avoid paying for news. Facebook is yet to comment on these charges, but the question is as much about revenue as it is about how news consumption has changed. The days of traditional outlets are gone. Social media is now the epicentre. Today's decision opens up more questions than answers. They've basically taken off their fig leaf of Facebook news and we're back to where we were when that whole um, debate around what is the value of news content was running out three years ago. People are reading fewer articles and watching more short-form videos for news. Take TikTok, for example. 47% of its users say they go to it for news. Meanwhile, millennials and Gen Z turn to Instagram for their daily dose of news updates. So social media has changed the way we consume news. And Facebook's latest move is an indicator of just that. Now let's look at Mauritius. It's an island nation, part of the African continent, located in the Indian Ocean and home to a Hindu majority population. Mauritius and India have ties that go long back and indeed look set to continue for the foreseeable future. India and Mauritius have unveiled new projects, including an airstrip, a jetty, and some other facilities that are located in the island of Agalega. Indeed, we are making history today on the islands of Agalega with the inauguration of the new airstrip, the new jetty, and several other development projects. This event marks another great moment for the remarkable an exemplary partnership between Mauritius and India. That was the Prime Minister of Mauritius. He was joined by Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi for attention. a virtual inauguration. As you can see, he highlighted the strong bonds that both nations share. The Indian Prime Minister also spoke of this and the need to work together for humanitarian and security reasons. Friends, development partnership हमारे राजनीतिक संबंधों का अहम स्तंभ रहा है हमारी विकास भागीदारी 
मोरिसस की प्राथमिकताओं पर आधारित है चाहे वो मोरिसस की ई ई जेड सुरक्षा से जुड़ी जरूरतें हो या फिर हेल्थ सिक्योरिटी भारत ने हमेशा मॉरिसस की जरूरतों का सम्मान किया है वी लुक एट बोथ दीज पार्टनरशिप्स स्टार्टिंग विद ई ई जेड सिक्योरिटी द मॉरिशस एज यू नो इज एन आइलैंड नेशन इट हैज अ मैसिव ई ई जेड दैट्स एक्सक्लूसिव इकोनॉमिक जोन इट्स एन एरिया ऑफ द ओशन बियॉन्ड योर टेरिटरी एन एरिया वेर यू हैव ड्यूरिस्टिक्शन ऑन ऑल रिसोर्सेज दैट्स योर ई ई जेड Now in the case of Mauritius this zone extends across 2.3 million square kilometers it's a vast area obviously difficult to monitor which explains why the island of agalega needed an airstrip and india built it for them reportedly at a cost of 250 million dollars an mou memorandum of understanding for this was signed back in 2015 that's when Uh, they they started work and the work has been ongoing for a few years now the air strip is reportedly 3 kilometers long and suited for the boeing p8i poseidon aircraft these are used for long range maritime reconnaissance and anti submarine warfare also suited for electronic warfare missions and search and rescue so this air strip in agalega is important it will help mauritius combat naval challenges like piracy drug trafficking and terrorism it can also be used for emergency responses and search and rescue like i mentioned so the benefits to mauritius are immense but what about india what's in it for india a base in a friendly country which can be used by indian forces if required to secure the indian ocean alongside mauritius so it's a win win but defense is not the only aspect of the india mauritius partnership there are other facets too not later than yesterday again thanks to your special consideration that with our republic mauritius became the first country to adopt the jan aushadi scheme <clears throat> this scheme will allow our country to source some 250 high quality medicines from the pharmaceutical and medical devices bureau of india you heard what he said india has launched the jan aushadi scheme to provide partner countries with affordable medicines the health security that the indian prime minister spoke about and mauritius is the first partner to get this this comes just weeks after another major development mauritius recently launched india's unified payments interface or upi also rupee card services so the range of cooperation is vast it highlights the importance that india gives to its ties with mauritius and the mutual benefits afforded by this age old friendship Before I begin the next story I want you to picture a scene a dystopian world where humans have been replaced by humanoid robots and there are robotic dogs in place of pets Sounds freaky right but soon it could become a reality over the past few years China has reportedly produced legions of robotic dogs armed with machine guns that are joining military exercises meanwhile an american startup called figure ai has developed a humanoid robot the likes of jeff bezos nvidia and microsoft have invested 675 million dollars in it is this the next level of technology or the beginning of the end our next report tells you chin shi huang was a famous chinese emperor upon his death he was buried in a tomb with 8000 life-size terracotta soldiers poised for battle it was a replica of the king's actual army the tomb complex was built more than 2000 years ago but china has come a long way since if it were to create a similar complex today you would not find terracotta fighters there or richly adorned chariots and weapons because it would most likely be full of dogs an army of canines not a pack of live pups we're talking about robo dogs over the past few years china has produced legions of robotic dogs these are four legged machines they kind of look like tap dancing insects or dystopian house flies coming for your electronics 
Either way, these robo-dogs are grabbing the world's attention. They are being used as electronic pets. They can be used to carry out mundane tasks. For instance, if you want that remote but don't want to get off the couch and don't have a sibling to boss around, the robo-dog can help you out. These robots have been used even by the Xi government to police strict lockdowns in China. But that's not all they can do. Recent reports claim that these dogs can be weaponized, armed with machine guns. They are now joining military exercises. Many critics dismiss these videos as propaganda by Beijing, saying that these robots have a slight build, they cannot handle bulky firearms, and even if they do, they will not have the speed and precision of trained soldiers. So far, no one is sure if these robotic dogs can outshoot seasoned troops. But America is not taking any chances. It sees vast potential in the technology. Last year, the US Marine Corps bought many units of these Chinese-made robotic dogs, mainly to evaluate their combat effectiveness. With the American government focusing on these robotic dogs, big corporations there are creating robotic humans. We're talking about figure AI a startup working to build humanoid robots. It was founded in 2022, and it has already developed a robot, Figure One. It looks and moves like a human. It is attached to a tether. It walks on two legs. It uses five-fingered hands to perform an activity. As you can tell, the robot is still in its nascent stage of development. It is supposed to be a general-purpose robot, to be used in manufacturing, shipping, logistics, and warehousing. With more robust AI systems, this humanoid can significantly impact the world, and tech giants know it. The likes of Jeff Bezos, Nvidia, and Microsoft have invested in Figure AI. The startup raised $675 million this week, and it is valued at $2.6 billion. Some say this is just the beginning. The humanoid robot market is supposed to reach $38 billion by 2035. Though some fear the flip side. They say, much like robotic dogs, humanoid robots can be used in warfare. And if misused, their dangers would know no bounds. So far, Figure AI has said that the humanoid robot is not intended for military applications. Intended. That's the operative word. Because, as the proverb goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. What if? It's the most profound question of life, also the most useless one, because it's usually asked after things go wrong. But why are we talking about it tonight? Because a star footballer has just been banned for doping and his fans are asking the same question. What if he'd taken better decisions? The player is Paul Pogba. He played for the French national team. In fact, he won the 2018 FIFA World Cup with France. They scored four goals in that final. One of them was netted by Paul Pogba. Many called him a generational talent, a future Ballon d'Or winner. But his career may have reached its end. He has been banned from, from playing football for four years. Now Pogba is 30 years old. So by the time he's, his ban ends, he will be 34. His prime will be behind him. I'm sure he saw it coming. He plays for Juventus in the Italian league. He was randomly tested in August last year. The results revealed a banned substance, testosterone. That's when Pogba's future was sealed. Of course, he's denied all wrongdoing. He says he will appeal this four-year ban, but not many football fans are buying it. For them, Pogba's career was only going in one direction, and that was down. It's a story of wasted talent. Pogba went to Juventus at the age of 19. He played there from 2012 to 2016, made 178 appearances and scored 34 goals. During this time, Juventus won four league titles. All this success attracted Manchester United. They signed Pogba for almost $116 million. It was a world record back then, $116 million. But soon the slide began. Pogba played 233 games for United. He managed just 39 goals. Critics called him an overpaid influencer. The coach called him a virus. So in 2022, he left Manchester United. He returned to Juventus. 
but things never fell into place. That same year, Pogba was in the middle of a blackmailing case. Five people tried to extort money from him. One of them was his brother. Then came the black magic saga. Paul Pogba was accused of hiring a witch doctor. What for? To put spells on his teammates, like Kylian Mbappe. Again, Pogba denied this charge, but he did admit to hiring a witch doctor. He thought it would protect him from injuries ahead of the 2022 World Cup. It was a big, big mistake. And it sums up his whole career. A lot of potential and talent, but not enough discipline and hard work. And it's not just true for athletes like Pogba, it's true for every single person. You can have all the talent and skill in the world, but you also need to back it up with discipline, with hard work and with good decisions. That's what sets you apart. That's what separates good from great. Here in India, we have a perfect example, cricketer Vinod Kambli. Commentators said he was more talented than Sachin Tendulkar, but that talent did not lead to success. Kamli's discipline issues were the talk of the town. He was eventually dropped from the team. Another example is boxer Mike Tyson. I know it may be a surprise for some of you. After all, many fans rated Tyson as a legend. But the truth is, he could have been the greatest of all time, if not for his violence, crimes and misogyny. So the moral of the story is clear. You can't ride your talent forever. It's important to hone it. You must surround yourself with good people, take rational decisions and work in a disciplined manner. Paul Pogba did not. And he's facing the consequences. If only he'd listened to the man he once called the greatest striker in history. That's Cristiano Ronaldo. Ronaldo once said, talent without hard work is nothing. It's simple but true. Now let's turn our attention to Haiti. It's a nation in the Caribbean, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, home to about 11 million people and overrun by gangs. Haiti was already on the brink. And yesterday, things got worse. The numerous gangs that, that control Haiti's capital ran riot. There was heavy gunfire in Port-au-Prince. People were seen fleeing their homes. At least four police officials were killed. A gang leader even threatened to abduct Haiti's police chief. So what led to this eruption of violence? Apparently, a trip by the Prime Minister, he's gone to Kenya and he's inked a new pact there. This may allow Kenya to send troops to Haiti to bring Haiti's gangs under control. Here's our report. The first objective of our fight is to ensure that Prime Minister Ariel Henry's government does not remain in power by any means. All of us, the armed groups in the provincial towns and the armed groups in the capital, are united today. My task to say as their spokesperson for all the armed groups, as president of the armed groups, I want to tell the poor, this movement is theirs, to tell them not to be afraid of the people that are in the streets. Thanks a lot. The man making these announcements is a gang leader. His name is Jimmy Cherizier. His nickname is Barbecue. Barbecue is a former police officer turned gang leader. He leads a faction called G9 Family and Allies and he's taken on the role of spokesperson for the armed gangs that have taken over most of Haiti. Barbecue asked the poor people in Haiti's capital Port-au-Prince to remain calm. He asked them not to be afraid. Clearly, they didn't believe him. Armed gangs fall on to us. We can't take it anymore. We have nowhere to go and we run with our belongings to put them away somewhere. Hundreds of Haitians fled Port-au-Prince yesterday. They were desperately trying to avoid the gunfire heard all over the capital. They didn't want to get caught in the clashes when the gangs took on the police. Yesterday's violence has left at least four police officers dead. They died during an attack on a police station. The gangs are determined to crush Haiti's police force. Barbecue even threatened to capture the police chief and some government ministers. The gangs also want to shut down the country's international airport. At least one airline suspended all flights yesterday after the gangs targeted the airport in Port-au-Prince. This is the present state of Haiti. But what provoked it? The gangs want to thwart Prime Minister Oriol Henry's plans. They want to stop him from returning to Haiti. He's presently in Kenya and he signed an agreement with Kenyan President William Ruto. 
Last year, Kenya had offered to lead a multinational force in Haiti. It was given the go-ahead by the United Nations. The Kenyans were tasked with bringing back safety and security. But they aren't the only ones. The Bahamas, Bangladesh, Barbados, Benin and Chad have all pledged to send in their troops. Other nations are sending money. Almost $11 million have already been deposited and 78 more million have been pledged. All this for a task force headed by Kenya to bring peace to Haiti. But there's one problem. A Kenyan court called the mission unconstitutional. This happened in January. Kenya and Haiti did not have a reciprocal agreement on police deployment. The Kenyan court said this made the peace mission unlawful. Haiti's Prime Minister went to Kenya to find a way around this technicality. A few hours ago, Henri and Ruto signed an agreement which allows Kenya to begin its mission. They should start reining in Haiti's gangs soon. That's why the gangs are acting up. It's why they've unleashed their fury on Port-au-Prince. But the deal has already been inked. We will now have to wait and see what Barbecue and his boys cook up next. For our last story today, let's go back to history, to the 1970s. This was the era of bell bottoms and disco. But for smokers, it was a confusing decade. People already knew that smoking was bad. Studies had linked cigarettes to cancer. Governments were intervening as well. With education programs, restrictions on selling to children, high taxes. Yet somehow, people still thought that smoking was fine. And why wouldn't they? Cigarettes were still everywhere, in magazine ads, on billboards, at sports events, in movies and TV shows, inside offices and bars. Country after country had a culture of smoking. And if everyone seemed to be doing it, could a thing really be that dangerous? That's what people thought. Now, fast forward a few decades. Today, a similar scenario is playing out, except this time, junk food is the menace. Or what scientists like to call ultra-processed food, UPF. They've given it a scary name to command the seriousness that junk food deserves. But before I get to the dark, worrying stuff, what is ultra-processed food? It includes food that has undergone multiple industrial processes. In simpler terms, food that has been beaten to, to a pulp and bathed in flavors, colors and other additives. It is ready to eat and looks absolutely delicious. Your burgers, chips, chocolates, fizzy drinks, these are the obvious examples, but even baked goods, protein bars, cereals and yogurts are part of this list. Yes, they're mouth-watering, but it's a scam because this food is seriously unhealthy and you already know that. For years, studies have linked ultra-processed food or UPF to poor health. It is high in added sugar, fat and salt. It is low in vitamins and fiber. So you know that junk food is coming for your waistline. But I'm here to tell you that it's doing way more. For the first time, an international team of researchers has held an umbrella review. This is a broad assessment. They studied almost 10 million people to understand how UPF or ultra-processed food affects the human body. This is the world's largest review of its kind. And here's what it found. UPF is directly linked to 32 diseases. This is not how I want to end a Friday or begin a new month. But I want you to picture something. Think of the worst thing that can happen to your health. Think of any parameter, mental, respiratory, cardiovascular, gastro, metabolic, cancer, mortality. Junk food poorly affects all of this. It increases risks of all kinds of problems. Obesity by 66%. Cardiovascular disease by 50%. Type 2 diabetes, 12%. Mental disorders by 53%, depression by 22%. It is also linked to asthma and cancer and increases the risk of death by 21%. These numbers are disconcerting. But people love their burgers and pizzas. The UK and the US consume the most UPF in the world, ultra-processed food. More than half their average diet consists of junk food. France and Sweden take the next two spots. India is 13th on the list. Doesn't sound that bad, does it? But over the past decade, the sale of junk food has tripled in India. Indians spent $30 billion 
on junk food in 2022, $30 billion. And according to the recent Household Consumption Expenditure Survey, Indians have been spending more on processed food and lesser on home-cooked meals. But it's important to note one thing here. Everyone does not choose to eat junk food. Many don't see another way like people from disadvantaged areas. Junk food usually accounts for 80% of their diet, and even people who can afford healthy food choose to avoid it. Because junk food is cheaper, more delicious, and it's everywhere. From TV ads and memes to office vending machines, our world frames junk food as an indulgence. And the warnings do not filter to our daily lives. So what can we do about it? We can't expect any better from food companies. Highly processed food is highly profitable. We can't demand good intentions from consumers either. Why would anyone expect a tired commuter or hungry office worker to resist a burger? That's just gaslighting. So let me go back to the example of cigarettes. Do you know how our perception changed towards smoking? When governments amped up their efforts, between the 1990s and early 2000s, governments pushed for obligatory warnings like no smoking signs or warnings on cigarette packets. They brought in strict regulation. With junk food too, strict regulation is the only way for centuries human beings have engineered what they eat. We say it's time. We regulate it as well. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Russia, people chant Navalny's name as his body is cremated into a Moscow church for his last rites. In the Amazon, researchers discover the world's biggest snake species, a new green anaconda. And can you imagine skiing in the snow in the middle of the desert? Well, anything is possible in Saudi Arabia as the kingdom hosts its first skiing competition. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1872. Yellowstone National Park was established. It was the world's first national park. It kicked off a new conservative wave. Currently, there are over 6,000 national parks in nearly 100 countries. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.